Let's get started. Uh, compilation is an awesome topic, and there's, there's a lot to discuss. All right. So this is just uh, what's on the docket for everyone here. Um, project two checkpoint. I think he's he'll post it on Gradescope. I think if it's not already up, it'll post it today. Uh, we're just trying to figure out. We looked to see ways to make the compilation go faster. Um, I, there wasn't anything obvious. But like when you submit this, it won't. It'll run like Clang format and Clang tidy, but it won't run the the full linter. Um, so it'll be. So you make sure you run that uh, yourself because we'll, we'll run it from this. Uh, it has to pass that. So again, the first checkpoint just be insert. We'll figure out what the delete uh, and then uh, scan key. And then this one will be, has to be, be the full concurrency. And again, this one, he's not checking for concurrency because uh, Grayscape only gives you a single thread. We'll do more exhaustive tests uh, in the final, final analysis. Okay? And then on Wednesday's class, I'll announce what's what, what about, uh, I'll start discussing project three. And I'll propose some uh, topics that you guys can look at. Certainly some things that we've talked about so far, some things we'll talk about today are germane or applicable uh, topics you could explore. Uh, but then the first class after spring break, on that first Monday, uh, in, we'll have in-class presentations where every, every group will come up and spend five minutes to say, hey, this is what we're going to do. Okay? So you should at least, I mean, I realize you still have to build the B, the, the B plus tree, so start thinking about what it is that you actually want to want to possibly uh, build for project three, okay? And if you're not sure about uh, to potential topics or want some further clarification, you know, I'll be around spring break and we can meet if necessary, okay? All right, query compilation is super important. Uh, it is the one of the main techniques that our people are using in modern systems, database systems today, to get best performance. So. You know, this is why we're going to spend the entire lecture on, on this. So we'll first talk about some background about what, it, what, what co, you know, code generation, why we actually want to do this or do the compilation. Then we'll talk about the, the two techniques, the code generation and transpilation, basically source-to-source -source compilation. And then we'll talk about the JIT compilation uh, using the LLVM because that was in the hyper paper that you guys read. But certainly this is not the only way to do, do JIT compilation. So we'll look at some real-world techniques including popping open Postgres and our own database system and seeing what the, the code gen compiler looks like for, for these different systems, okay? So last class, or a couple classes ago, we, we've been talking about uh, how we're gonna get our system to run as fast as possible. And we said that the, you know, the, the, the way we could do this is, is, is reduce the number of instructions we have to execute. Right? and also get more instructions per, per cycle. So if you start to think about how actually hard this, this is to really get you know, good speed up just based on, on instructions, uh, this is a back of the napkin calculation that the Hecaton, guy, Hecaton guys did for their paper when they were explaining why they were doing cogeneration and compilation in their system. And it basically says that if you want to have your data system go 10x faster, then you need to execute 90% fewer instructions. This is doable, right? This is something, uh, you know, not just, you know, maybe turning you know, a, a compiler optimization flag to get, you know, better, better, better binaries, but through careful redesign of a database system architecture, we, we can achieve this. But if we want to get 100x faster, but now we have to execute 99% fewer instructions. Now this starts to get really, really hard. Um, and so what Today's class, and then Wednesday's class, and then after, after the spring break, when we start talking about vectorization, right, these are the techniques we're going to use to allow us to execute fewer instructions to do the same amount of work so that we can try to achieve this, this 100x. Right? Because Intel, it's not ratcheting up the clock speed anymore. They're giving us wider SIMD registers, more specialized instructions. There's more things Intel is going to give us this than clock speed, so we have to design our system in order to try, uh, try to achieve this. And there's not going to be a magic flag in GCC and Clang, like O100, that we can use to, to make this happen. Again, it's us as the database system developers uh, have to design the system. And again, fortunately, people pay us a lot of money to do this, so that's good. So this is why we want to do code specialization or query compilation. So the idea of code specialization is that instead of having general purpose code in our database system to process queries or do whatever tasks we want in our system, uh, we're going to generate code that is specific to 
the one task we're trying to, to, to process or complete. And, and for our purposes today, it's always going to be a query. So we have a query, and ra rather than running this through a general purpose system, we will then generate code that is hard-coded or baked just to execute that one query. And the reason why this is going to be better for, for, for performance is because in the general purpose system, you, you're going to have all this indirection. You're going to have all these if clauses or switch statements to deal with all the different possible data types or operands or predicates or aggregations you could be executing while you process the query. And that means that as I look at every single tuple and I call my aggregate function, there's going to be a switch statement that says, if my data type is this, do this. If my data type is that, do that. And we don't avoid all of that. We strip it down to be just the exact instructions I need in order to execute that query. So, this is going to be tricky to do, uh, and it's not to say that people, when, they, when, when we write general purpose database system code, they're not uh, doing this just because they're dumb. They're doing it for mostly software engineering reasons, right? You're, you're making it so the code is reusable, so you don't have to have this, you know, duplicate operations over and over again, you know, adding two numbers versus adding two, two floats. Uh, and we also write code in such a way that's easier for people to maintain and support. But the problem is going to be, as I said before, is the way we write code that's easy for humans to understand are actually going to be the worst way you can actually uh, write code for, for the CPU. So I'm going to show a bunch of examples. I'm going to use this simple three-table schema, A, B, C. Right? A and B have primary key integers and some value. And then C just has two uh, foreign key references to the primary key at A and the primary key in B. So I'm going to show a bunch of examples doing three-way joins on, on this table on the foreign keys. So let's see now how we could process this query here, a three-way uh, join with, with a nested query, or nested aggregation, using the uh, interpretation model, the iterator model that we talked about before. Right, so again, we have a group by, or an aggregation, or a group by for B inside this, this inner query, and then we're just going to do a join on, on A, B, and C. So the query plan would look like this. Right? This is, for our purposes here, this is just the logical plan. We're not saying what the join algorithm actually is. But we can just assume that, that it's a hash table. We're not saying how we're doing the aggregation. Assume, again, also it's a hash table. So if we go back and use the, the for loop iterator model approach that we saw uh, last class, the way we'd execute this query is, again, just a bunch of for loops where in one operator, they iterate over the, the target input. In this case here, we're scanning B for every tuple in B. Then we shove it up into the next operator to do the filter. And this shoves it up to do the, the join, right? So again, this is going to be slow for an in-memory database, or it's still going to be slow for a disk-based database, because we're copying a lot of uh, you know, all the data from one to the next. Yes, we can, can combine these, but you know, we're having all these next calls and these emit calls. Like All this, these function calls are, are going to be expensive for us. Right? And we have to do this. Right? We have this general purpose eval pre evaluation, evaluate predicate functions, because the, we don't know, actually know what the predicate actually looks like. We just know we're going to have this, source, source, you know, this expression tree that we want to evaluate. And all this code here to do the, to do the, uh, the iteration over the next, over the, 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 every tuple from the child, it just calls this function. Uh, it's, it's not doing anything special, and it's not doing anything in line. Right? So again, there's a lot of overhead from all these next calls because we could have you know, different types of indirection. But the expression itself is also going to be expensive as well. Right? So we just take this inner part here, right, where b.val equals question mark, meaning it's an input parameter. This is a prepared statement. So at runtime, someone's going to pass in the value for this parameter. And then we're going to add one to it. So typically, the way you, you, you represent these uh, uh, predicates is through these expression trees. And the way to think about this is that the, the database system will enter the root and invoke whatever this operator is and say, hey, hey I want to evaluate this expression tree from the root. And then, it, and then it has to now traverse down into the tree and evaluate all its children and start pushing uh, results up. So say we come down here, we look at the equal operator, we start going to the left child, we see that our expression here is a tuple attribute on b.val. So we do a lookup of the current tuple we're looking at because we're calling this you know, evaluate predicate function for every single tuple as we scan along. So we'd say, all right, I want b.val, so now I gotta look at my table schema and say, all right, well, the, the, the val attribute is the second one, or the second attribute, so I, need to, I know how to jump over here to get, get 1,000, and then I produce that as my output. Now I traverse down to this, this side of the tree, this says I want parameter zero, so I go look up my, my parameter array, find the first one, and that's 99, so I, I get that there. Then this is just evaluating a constant, so I just take one, shove it up here, 
add these together, I get 1,000. Then now I can, do my, uh, I, I can do my comparison, and the result is true. So again, I have to traverse this tree for every single tuple that I evaluate. So I have a billion tuples. I'm making one billion times, you know, whatever, four, four jumps for, for all these different expressions, you know, function calls. And we're doing this because, again, as humans, it's easy for us to reason about how to represent the where clause through this tree. But again, that's going to be slow because, because you know, all this indirection. So this is what, again, this, these two things, of, of avoiding that, that the interpretation of the query plan to deal with all the indirection of the different operators, as well as the predicates that we're going to have to evaluate inside those operators, are the main two things we're, we're going to try to uh, uh, get rid of through code specialization. So, um, right, so again, the idea is that anytime we have a CPU intensive task in our database, we want to then convert it or compile it into machine code that can then we can execute directly. So it's like, again, we get rid of all the switch statements, we get rid of all the if clauses, other than you know, checking whether the predicate values are true, and it just comes down to be stripped down to be exactly what the, the query wants with minimal lookups and indirection. So I've already shown how to do this for access methods or evaluate predicates or, or operative execution. We can also do it for stored procedures or prepared statements. Right? With the logic of PL SQL, we can then convert into uh, machine code. Um, only Oracle really does this. Uh, predicate evaluation, we also saw other parts of the system, like logging operations, like on recovery, if I had to replay these log records, rather than me looking at the schema, and then having indirection to say, oh, my schema, my log record has these types and, and these values, therefore I know how to apply them to the database. I could compile or code, have code specialization uh, methods applied to making recovery work faster. No database system actually does this one. Predicate evaluation is, in, is probably the most common, followed by operator, access methods, operative execution, and then it's only a few number of systems actually do this. And this is actually something we're exploring in, in our own system, right? So I've already said this before, but why do we want to do this? Well, we can do this because we know what the attributes are in our, t in our database ahead of time. Right? In the relational model, you have to declare a schema. So it's not like we're looking at arbitrary JSON fields or arbitrary CSV files. We know exactly what the, sch the schema looks like. We know exactly what the, the, the size of the data is. The var chars have to be treated differently, but at least we know that we have a you know, fixed size pointer to that var char. So therefore, we can instead of having all these function calls to do lookups and say, you know, give me the, you know, I want this attribute from this tuple and therefore I jump into this function that knows how to do the arithmetic to find the value I'm looking for. I can just inline directly the, the address math to go get exactly the, the data that I'm looking for. Likewise, we, all our predicates are known ahead of time because we're given the where clauses or we're given whatever, whatever's in our projection list. So we know exactly how to then instead of representing it as a tree, we can represent it exactly to be the, 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 you know, the predicate that we're actually trying to apply. And then likewise, we want to get rid of all the, the function calls we have inside loops so that we have this tight kernel that we don't have to do any branching inside of it. We just iterate very quickly over and over again. And this will get some benefits from the compiler in this case because it can do some unrolling. And then in some cases, it could, could do some auto vectorization, which we'll, we'll cover on, on Wednesday. Right? All right, so at a high level, the database system that we're talking about now looks like this. So I haven't shown this picture before, but this is basically the pipeline within a real database system of, of when a query shows up. Right? So to say there's a networking layer here, a SQL query shows up. First thing, we're going to parse the SQL. And from the parse SQL, we get an abstract syntax tree. This is just the tokens, like the select, the names, right? all the strings that are inside the, the, the SQL itself. Then we run this into our binder, and the binder does a lookup in the catalog to replace the the string tokens of the names of objects in the database with internal identifiers. Like, so if my table is called foo, the abstract sy sy syntax tree will see, oh, someone's doing a lookup on, a, on something called foo. I do look up my catalog and say, well, foo corresponds to this table, and here's the internal identifier to allow you to find it more quickly in the future. So then you pass along now this annotated AST into our query optimizer, which then is going to generate a physical plan. There could be more steps, we'll see this later in the semester, but for our purposes today, we only care about that the optimizer generates a physical plan, which you then now feed in some, to some compiler or the transplier or, or the, the, the code gen engine, whatever you want to call this, that's going to take the physical plan, which is going to be those, uh, that operator tree, and then it's going to spit out some kind of native code or byte codes that we can then interpret. 
All right, so now the idea is that we take the physical plan we've gotten from this and we convert it into source code or native code that does exactly what that query wants to do without any indirection. Okay? So now how you actually run this compiler is going to vary between the different systems and what this actually is coming out of this thing can vary to the different approaches that, that we'll talk about today as well. All right? So one thing I'll also say too is like the, in the cases where we are going to actually compile the, uh, the, the, the physical plan into like machine code that we can then link, you know, or execute in, in a set of our database system process. Because we're the, we're, as us as the database developers, we're the ones writing this, this translation step, we don't have to have any security concerns because it's not like we're taking arbitrary C code from the user and running it inside our database system, which would be stupid, right? So because we control this step, we don't have to do extra security checks to make sure that like, we're not gonna have like buffer overruns or malicious code and things like that. This is code that us as the database system developers will spit out, so we, we, we can assume it's sanitized unless you know, somebody on the inside tries to take us down. Right, we, we can assume that this is safe for us to run directly inside our database process, and we don't have to sandbox it at all. We'll see uh, when we talk about UDS, like in some commercial systems, like in, in Oracle, for example, you can write UDS in, in C, which obviously is super dangerous because you can jump to any address space uh, in, you know, in your process. So in that case, they'll fork off a, a sandbox and run it there, so you can't hurt the real database system. But again, in our code, we don't worry about this. Yes? The question is, how do I know where the, if I have a global data structure, how do I know where those global data structures are in the compiled code? The compiled code can invoke anything in the, uh, it'll get linked in with anything that's running inside your database system. So you wouldn't want to have it like, you know, uh, have this arbitrary memory address that has the object that you want. You would have a way to link it and say, well, here's the function that I can call connect that can again give me access to the object that, that, that I can do what I want. Yeah. It's the same thing as like if it's like arbitrary C++, like I can link it with an existing library and be able to invoke into that library. It works the same way. Like the ADI of, of Linux or whatever operating system you're doing ha handles all that for you. All right. So there's two approaches to this. There's transpilation and, and the JIT compilation. So translation, also called source-to-source -source, uh, compilation, the idea here is that the database system will have specialized code that emits new source code. So like it'll have C++ code that spits out C++ code. And then you then run that, C++, that, that new source code through a regular compiler, link that in, and, and, then that, and run that. And that's, that's your, your database, uh, that's your query you're going to execute. Right? The other approach is JIT compilation where Instead of generating, uh, you know, direct like you know higher level uh, source code, we're gonna we're gonna generate this low level IR or immediate, in, intermediate representation. Think of like the LLVM IR or the JVM bytecode. We're gonna emit that directly, and then we can then invoke that inside of our database. We can either compile it or or interpret it. So at a high level, the end result is still gonna be the same. That we're gonna take our physical query plan and generate uh, executable code that is you know, baked just for that query plan. <coughs> Excuse me. Whether we're doing that because we generate you know, C++ code first or generate this little IR first, the, the compilation time is, is going to differ between these two. And there's also software engineering differences as well. But at the end of the day, it's still going to be the same thing. This is, gonna be, this is no interpretation of, of or having these different lookups for, uh, for the different types of indirection we could have working on arbitrary data types, the, the, the query plan we're generating that comes out of the compiler is baked just for that one query. Okay? So we'll go through both these one by one. So the, one of the first database systems in the modern era, and I'll explain what that is when we talk about system R, one of the first database systems in the modern era that's doing code generation was this thing called HiQ out of the uh, University of Edinburgh. And like, like I said, what it would do is like for a given query plan that the optimizer gave it, it would write out a, a C++ code that implements the, the executable plan for that query. And all our predicates and all our type conversions are all baked exactly into the query plan based on what the schema is uh, for that given table. And then they just do a fork exec on GCC, 
have, have GCC spit out a shared object, link that into our database system process, and then we just invoke that uh, to execute the query. So the way to think about this is the, the, the source code we're generating here is going to have a, 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 like a main function. It's not obviously going to be called name. It's going to have a function that, that the name is known and has the, the parameter signature is known to the database system. So when you get the shared object and want to invoke the query, you know you just call that one function. And then it spits back whatever, whatever the result is. Right? So as we'll see as we go along, you're obviously going to pay a big penalty for, in performance for having to fork exec GCC because that's firing up another process. There's a context switch. GCC wants to read its own config files. And if you're doing this for every single query over and over again, it's going to be slow. And this is what the JIT compilation is going to solve. Let's see roughly how this works. So uh, we have our, our query here. Uh, select star from A, where A.val equals question mark plus one. So for the interpreted plan, it's that, you know, the, the sort of for loop that I showed before in the first example. Right? We're going we're gonna, to uh, iterate over every single tuple uh, for the new tuples we have, get a tuple at a given offset, evaluate our predicate, and then admit its output. So in the first step here, when we invoke this function, what it has to do is go look in the catalog and figure out what the, the schema looks like for the table. Then you've got to calculate the offset uh, based on the tuple size. So I know to jump to the block and jump to, to the fixed like offset. And then I return the point to the tuple. Now, you can cache this first one here. You can try to avoid having to go get the schema every single time. But these other ones here, you still have to do. But now the big cost is going to be in our, and when we validate our predicate, because now we've got to traverse that expression tree uh, and pull all the values up and see whether it, it, it returns true or false. And then if so, then we emit our tuple. All right? So what Haiku is going to do is have a templated plan where the this is all Python, but they're doing, this, they're, they're doing their templates in C++, where they know that they have to do an iteration or scan over a, uh, over a table. And the only thing that's really going to be different is what are the, the predicates or the different values you're going to have to substitute uh, you know, when, when you want to evaluate the scan. Right? So the tuple size, the predicate offset, and the parameter value, like these are the things that are going to be told to us when we invoke the query. But everything else, the predicate will change, uh, you know, could change from one query to the next, but everything else is going to be always the same from one scan to the next. So now all I need to do is take these values and take this template and just the, the, at runtime, it will just fill these things in for me. Uh, this one here, I just check to see whether that values are true or not. And same thing, I, I, I just get it from up here, and then I can evaluate this. So again, I got rid of the lookup for the, for the, to get the tuple, and I got rid of the, the lookup to evaluate the predicate. So I removed the two functions that were going to cause us to have jumps inside of our, our for loop, and now the, 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 the CPU can, can iterate through this for loop very quickly. Yes? How are we evaluating the predicate using the predicate offset? How, how are we using the, pred the predicate offset? Yes. So like, are we, we have all the predicates in the memory? Like so, so, we have to, so we have to get, the predicate offset is what attribute in the, in the tuple do I want to evaluate? So I would have to know, uh, I want, I want, what was it, b.value. So, so this would tell me at what offset of the tuple is b.value. That's fine. But like, so how are you converting this to val equal equal to parameter value plus one? Like, how do you know the predicate itself? Like, this is the predicate, right? So, so yeah, so you're back. The val function was traversing the tree and finding out this predicate, right? Uh, yeah, so you have this predicate. Yes, so how are you converting that into the code directly? Like, because I, because what do you mean? What do you mean? Like, I know. Okay, so you are first, then you are traversing a tree during the compilation time once. Correct. Yeah, so his, yeah, his question is, how did I convert a.val into question mark plus one? How did I convert that into this? So the, I have to take a pass through the query plan that comes out of the optimizer and figure out what, it, what is the predicate is, that it's actually doing. And I convert the, the expression tree into this line here. So you may think, well, isn't that doing a, a lookup? Don't have to do it. Yeah, you don't, if I have a billion tuples, I only do that once. Right? Whereas this case here, you have to do it a billion times. Right? So it should be obvious why, again, why this is, this is going to be a big win for us. Because everything's baked in, there's no additional lookups, and we can just iterate very quickly over every single tuple, evaluate our predicate, and produce the output. Yes? How is that different from, like, you just write a C function and you take it those badly? So his question is, how is this, like, for the predicate? No, I mean for the whole, like, 
the whole thing? Yeah, the whole thing. Because like right now you're like generating the C++ code and then like at the runtime. Yeah. Like how is it different from you pre-write those code in? Correct. We'll get there. So his question is, in my example here, when the query shows up, uh, it's going to generate this, this, this structure every single time. So if I execute, in theory, if I don't do any query plan caching, if I execute the same query over and again, it's going to pre-generate this thing over and over again, compile it over and over again. And so couldn't you recognize that, oh, well, I only have to do so many things in a database system. Like, like there's only so many predicates, I, I, you, know, you know, equals less than, greater than, there's only, in, in the for loops, there's only so many things I'm going to do to execute a query. Couldn't I just pre-generate all those primitives, is the word I'll actually use. And in that way, at runtime, I don't have to generate C++ code. I just invoke these functions directly. That's what VectorWise does. We'll see that in, in later in the class. Yes. And that's actually what we do in our system. The number of predicates can be dependent on the depth of the tree, right? The number of predicates depend on the depth of the tree. But I think his point is, like, say, like, what am I doing here? Val equals something, right? And so instead of having, uh, again, having a function, instead of having this if clause here to do this, uh, I could have a function that says, take two integers, check to see whether they're equal, and pre-compile that. Yeah, but you don't know, right, how many predicates, like, it can be a 5 depth 3, then how do you... No, know? but, but you can decompose them, right? Okay. To, like, just, like, the conjunction clauses. No, no, it's not, it's, now it's an array, it's not a tree. A equals 1, and B equals 2, and C equals 3. Each of those ones could be a function called, you know, something equals something, and I invoke them in an array one after another. I don't have to traverse any tree. But to construct it, when you have to construct it, you have to do that thing, then here also you are constructing it. So what's the point of having functions for individual? Uh, one, there'll be, there'll be vectorization we'll talk about when we talk about vector-wise. But like, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. The compilation cost is, is what's what going to kill this approach, right? So if you don't have to now compile something equals something every single time you execute a query, in his example, can you just cache that, or compile it once and just link it? Yes. Compile. Yes. This is, this is what VectorWise does. All right. Um, right. So, uh, related to his question is, well, how can my generate query code invoke and touch other parts of the system if I don't know where the memory addresses is? Again, well, this is just C++ code. We're going to link it in with our database system uh, shared object. So if we expose an API to allow you to go get access to the internal components of our database system, then our, our, you know, our, our cogen query plan could invoke and touch those things as well. Right? So like, if I need to access the, the transaction manager, I got to have a function that says, you know, for my current execution context, give me my transaction manager. And now my, my on-the-fly on code can invoke that and you know, check to see whether it's allowed to commit or not, things like that. So it's almost as if, like, it's just the same thing as the code we would write in our database system, but we're writing this and compiling it on the fly at runtime. So us, as the database system developers, we don't know exactly whatever query is going to show up, it, but we can still do, you know, we can still invoke the pieces of the system and actually make it happen. All right? So this, this, is, this, this can be problematic in a... Uh, and, a, and a JIT system with LLVM, because if it's C++, then you have these mangled paths to the functions. Like, if you ever looked at C++, what the functions actually look like when you, when you look at their names, like in GDB, unless they do unmangling, you know, it's these long strings with, like, the class name and, and like, the function name and things like that. Um, and that can get a bit gnarly, so you need a, you need a way to, to bridge into the, the, the database system to do that. In, in their world, because they're generating C code, it, it's not an issue. Or C++, it's not an issue because they just invoke the other functions as if it was all being compiled at the same time, right? The other nice thing you get about this translation approach is that it makes debugging a lot easier because now if I crash in my 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 generated code, I can just use GDB and all my standard debugging tools to figure out why I crashed, and that's actually a big going to be a big problem for the LLVM stuff. Uh, you do you do have to have do a little extra work to figure out, like, well, what is the C++ code that generated the C++ code that crashed? You have to, you have to make that jump and add, you know, debug symbols or hints about how that happened. But again, it's, it's not as bad as it is in LLVM. 
All right, so let's we'll look at some ex, uh, experiments that they did for haiku to understand the, the benefits of their approach. So this paper is big old. I think it's uh, 2010 now. Um, but I like it a lot because they, they generate all the different variations of the way you could do translation or you could build a database system, and they put it all in, in a single engine and, and, and compare against all of them. So they're going to have uh, uh, five different approaches. So the generic iterators would be like the textbook implementation of a database system where you have like the volcano model and you're, you're calling these functions inside the for loops to, to evaluate things. You're calling next, next, next over again. Then they're going to have a, a slightly more optimized version where now you have iterators that are specific to the different types of columns you could be accessing or attributes you could be accessing in your database. Um, and you, you can evaluate the, the predicate before you pass it up to the next operator in the tree. They're basically doing predicate pushdown. Then you have these hard-coded implementations where like, they had a grad student implement like, a best effort uh, approach with like, the generic iterators and predicates equivalent to this one, and then a more optimized version that's equivalent to this one. But again, it's like, hard-coded just for the query and not like a general purpose engine. And then the last one is uh, what their source-to-source their, you know, -source compiler or code generator engine is going to spit out for queries. Um, the way to think about this, also, the optimized hardcoded one, is, is what he was asking about. Like, can I pre-compile all the, the predicates and types ahead of time? And now I'm just sort of linking together these different functions. So that's, when, that's what this one is. So uh, for this one, they are running, uh, I think it's just a scan uh, or a join query over two 10,000 uh, uh, tuple tables to produce 10 million. And so what you see is that for the case of the generic iterators, you know, surprise it performs the worst. And then as you get over here, the, the difference between the optimized hard-coded one and the haiku one, they're about the same because the, the, the haiku -like engine is spitting out C++ code that is roughly equivalent to what the hard-coded one can do. So the idea now, again, for any arbitrary query, instead of me having to write code by hand over and over again, I can have the engine generate that code directly. Right? The, uh, the other interesting thing to point out, too, is like we have a lot more memory stalls here in the, uh, the generic one just because there's so much like, indirection uh, and we're doing these jumps and we don't know exactly what, what piece of memory we're going to read you know, ahead of time. Whereas in these cases, again, the, the for loop is super tight. We can rip through things very quickly and then the Harvard prefetcher could bring things into memory ahead of time for us. Okay? Yes? This kind of imply that there's like never really a case where you don't really want to inline like small functions? Like, so his, his statement is this basically says that this argues for the case that you almost never want to inline small functions. Or not inline, or not inline them. For the, inside the for loop kernels. Yes. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yes. Um, yeah, I think for small functions, yes. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of like, if there's predicates that are really expensive or really large, or like functions that are really large. But I, actually, I think the compilers these days actually do a pretty good job for figuring out what to inline. So in the case of like Haiku, when, it, when, it's, when it's code genning the source code, I don't think you want to put explicit like inline hints. I think you just want the compiler to do whatever it wants to do. I think that's the sort of the conventional wisdom now for C++. You don't add inline anywhere. You let the compiler figure things out. Okay. What's the downside of this approach? Well, it's going to be the compilation cost now, right? So for this one, they're going to compile with O0 and O2. O0 basically is no optimizations. O2 is with uh, the most aggressive optimizations that are considered to be safe. And obviously, there's more passes when you do O2, so therefore the compilation time uh, goes up. So this is for TPCH, right? This is, this is not the query execution time. This is just the compilation time, right? So now you're starting to get into uh, problems because, in the case of Q3, it's going to take me 600 milliseconds to 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 compile it. But in some cases, the query can be done in maybe 100 milliseconds. So I'm spending more time doing compilation than. I am actually, you know, that I'm spending on actually executing the query, right? So this is this, this is gonna be a problem f with with this approach, uh, and we'll see MemSQL later in the in, in the class. But like MemSQL, actually, their first implementation actually did this, and when you look at some of the early blog articles, which they've since removed, but you look in the archive, you can still find them, right? They would have examples where like you run a query and it takes one second 
to run, even though it does no work because they are fork executing GCC from their, 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 the C++ code they were generating for that query, compiling it, then linking back in and run it. But they did a good job caching everything so that when you execute the same query again in their, in their examples, they would show the, comp the execution time would be now zero because they can just reuse that binary over and over again. Okay. So the, as I said in the beginning, the operators, the, the, the way we can organize our query plan tree is useful for us to reason about as humans, makes the code reusable, makes the code easily extensible, but it's, again, it's not gonna be the most efficient way to execute it. And in the case of the haiku stuff, again, even though we could execute C++ code, that would be a more efficient way to execute these queries. It's going to be slow for us to compile, right? A big issue also too with Haiku is that they're not going to support full pipelining. They're still going to generate on a per operator, the, the, the for loop for that one operator, still have an emit function to shove it up to the next operator, who's then is going to have its own for loop to process things. Now they can do a predicate push down so that when you do the scan on the table, they'll evaluate the predicate. But everything else up in the query plan, again, it's going to be like that next call where you have, you know, you have to run your own for loop as well. So. To understand what, how we can get better performance with pipelining, we go back to this three-way join query, um, and now we're gonna divide it up into explicit pipelines. And again, a pipeline is a portion of the query plan where I can take a single tuple and ride it up as far as I can up into the query plan until I reach some point where I can't continue up in the query plan until I go get, get the next tuple, get all the tuples that are coming within my pipeline. So the easiest one to understand here is, is, is pipeline two, I'm scanning B, then I'm applying my, my predicate, but now I want to do my, my aggregation on the group by, but I can't, I can't go past this, this operator until I get all the tuples into my hash table for my aggregation because I'm computing the count. So I need to know what is the count of the number of tuples that I have for the, for, you know, on the group by clause before I can pass anything up over here. In the case of pipeline four over here, I can scan C and assuming I've already built the hash table to do the joins on A and B, I can take a single tuple, write it up here, check to see whether it, if, it, if I do the join, it matches. If so, then I can run it up here and check to see whether I can do the join at A and whether it matches. As the idea is, again, we can have the pipeline go, the tuple go as far as we can in, 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 you know, up in the query plane until we hit a pipeline breaker, right? So this is what Hyper does. So Hyper actually has two main ideas in the paper you guys, you guys read. So the first is that they're going to do this push-based uh, uh, query plan or processing model, but then they're also going to do uh, just-in-time compilation of the query plan using uh, LLVM, right? And so, you know, when you read the paper, hopefully you didn't read the appendix. I should have warned you ahead of time because there's all this LLVM IR. I don't understand it. Like it's it's not really useful. The core material, what's actually going on in the paper, was was the, the front body of it. So again. The, what, the reason why they're going to do this push-based model is that more than just keeping things in your CPU caches, now you can keep tuples and values in your CPU registers, which are even faster than, than L1 cache. So now as I, as I go up the query plan in my pipeline, if I'm just having the same tuple in my, in my CPU registers, then I can rip through it very, very quickly. Right? Um, the, for those who don't know, actually, who here has heard of LLVM before? Or here has not heard of LLVM before? Okay, perfect. So LLVM is, uh, it originally stands for the low-level virtual machine, although you shouldn't think of it as a virtual machine, like, not like VirtualBox or VMware. Um, it originally started at UIUC in like, uh, I think like 2000 or 1999, uh, and they were trying to build a tool to investigate like dynamic compilation techniques for, for programming languages. Um, and they end up building this like toolkit that's going to have all these different uh, uh, components you would need to build a full-fledged compiler. And the idea is that rather than having a, you know, being compiled for only one programming language, it would sort of have different front-end plugins. You can then take different programming languages, build a, a, a front-end for it that can then convert it to the LLVM IR, and then from there you can then compile the the into into machine code. So, Apple is invested heavily in this. They hired one of the main guys at a UIUC. Uh, in like 2004, 2005, and he basically runs their, uh, you know, their, their, all, all the work they do on Clang and LLVM based on this, right? So again, what's going to happen is we can take any arbitrary language and convert it down to this low-level IR that's going to sort of look like assembly, 
but it's designed specifically for the sort of the, the virtual machine that 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 LLVM provides. And then on the back end, they can then compile that IR into whatever your target target ISA is. So it supports x86, it supports ARM. So you can take any arbitrary language, convert it to the IR, and then have it spit out to any CPU ISA that the that LLVM supports, right? So an important thing to understand, though, is that in the case of Hyper, Hyper is going to have C++ code admit LLVM IR directly. So Haiku was having C++ code generate C++ code. Hyper is having C++ code generate IR. But the rest of the system, just like in Haiku, does not need to be written in the same language that the, uh, that the query plan is, 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 is generated in. So the rest of Hyper is written in C++, and it can still make calls to C++ code, but you have to mangle the, the, the function names, the class names, as I said. There's, you know, LLVM doesn't do that for you for free, but you can still have the IR code call into your C++ code. And so you still get the same benefit of everything running in, in the same dress space. Right? So now let's go back to this query plan and see how we would generate a uh, uh, source code that would do the, the, the push-up the, the push approach in, in Hyper. So now, for, uh, for these, think of these, these different for loops as the different pipelines. And again, the idea of a pipeline is it's, it's, it's a for loop it's, or a bunch of for loops that can take a single tuple and keep processing it as far as I can up into the query plan. For, so if we're doing the scan on A, it's just a for loop on A, and then we evaluate a predicate, and then we can materialize it into, into our hash table, right? Then now we, do this, we jump over to pipeline B. Uh, we can then do scan through that, apply our predicate, build our hash table. Then we can then uh, materialize the output of the of the of the, the aggregation table on B, but that now here in pipeline C we have three nested for loops. So we're going to take a tuple in C, and then uh, try to do a join against it in uh, on against B, and then if that matches, we try to do the join against it on on A, and then then that that is correct. Then we can we can spit it up as our output. So for one tuple in C, we can do the, the join in A, the join in B, and then produce an output if necessary. We don't have any switch to another, to another tuple. Yes? Um, is there multiple ways to generate these pipelines? Like, how to break these, and is there like the optimal way to do it? And so his question is, is, is there multiple ways to generate these pipelines? And if so, is there always going to be an optimal way to do this? Um, the typical optimization strategy is that you, you well, actually, there's two things. One is, are there different ways to generate this query plan? Yes, because right? that's what the query optimizer does. And so from our perspective in this class, we're just trying to say, well, the optimizer gave us a query plan. How can we generate pipelines for it? And in that case, it's a pretty simple heuristic to, to decide where these pipelines are, should look like. Right? And the typically way you do this is the, you start with like the, this would be the, the, the left side of the tree of any join, that's a pipeline feeding to the join. And then on the right side, you try to have the, the, the pipeline go all the way up until you hit, hit a pipeline breaker. So the conversion process, to answer your original question, yes, there's different ways I could generate the pipeline for a physical plan. Like, I could have a pipeline in here that have a new pipeline. It'd be stupid, but I could do that. But the heuristic to find the optimum one for a given physical plan is, is pretty straightforward. The harder decision is like, should I join A, B, or B, A? Like, all that before. Okay? So, again, what Hyper is doing, Hyper is going to take, instead of generating the pseudocode, they're going to generate the LLM IR that does exactly these steps, compile this as one giant function, all the pipelines together, and then now it's just staged as, all right, I'll run this for loop, and when that's done, now I jump to this part, or just, it's actually not a jump, it's just, you know, just executing sequentially. Then I do the, this for loop, then I do that for loop, and then I do this last for loop for the pipeline. All right? So in our new system, we can actually compile these pipelines separately. In this version of Hyper, everything was compiled all at once. So you had to have all the, the IR generated for the, for the entire query plan, for all your pipelines generated together in this giant function, then you fire it off to, uh, to LLVM. So let's look uh, at some performance numbers comparing uh, two different versions of Hyper. One is doing the LLVM IR, and then one is doing the, the Haiku approach where you're, you're spitting out C++ code and then fork exec in GCC. Then we have the vectorwise approach, which is using his pre-compiled predicate uh, method that he mentioned. 
MonadyB would generate, uh, it generates what looks like an IR, but then they have an interpreter for it. They don't actually compile it to machine code. And then Oracle does, does nothing. It's, uh, it's just interpreting the query plan in the same way we always did, right? So this is also not measuring the compilation time. This is just saying, like, assuming I have everything compiled ahead of time, how fast can I go? And so because the, in the case of the LM, LM version of Hyper, they're doing more aggressive, uh, more pipelining, right? They're making sure that the pipeline is as is, is long as possible, that they can do sli things slightly better than this supposed version. And the Oracle is always going to lose, again, because it's always doing interpretation, right? For the case of, uh, like, for Q1, Q1 is, it's, it's, there's no join. It's a single table. It's just a bunch of aggregations. So that one you, you can do more efficiently if, if you cogen everything. Q5 is, a, is like five or six joins, and the output is pretty simple. So you don't get as much big of a benefit because the major cost in executing this query is always going to be the join. That's going to be pre-compiled anyway um, to, to, you know, to probe a hash table, for example, or invoke the hash function. So in that case, you're not going to get that big of a benefit for, for the cogen side of things. All right? So let's now look at the compilation cost. So now, this is not a true like apples to apples comparison because I'm t I'm like taking the numbers from the haiku paper and mashing it together with the, the the hyper results. So they're not running on the same hardware. I think like the hyper guys are running on like a Xeon. Uh, this is running on a Core 2 Duo from like you know 2008 2009. The scale factor is still the same. They're still compiling the same TPCH queries. It's sort of the relative difference is what matters, right? Just because they have a slightly newer CPU, it, you know, it's not going to magically get faster. So this is just showing you that not having to then parse the C++ code, run through your, you know, your AST and your tokenizer and then compile it as you would in GCC or Clang, but just emitting the IR directly, then being able to run your optimization passes on that inside the LLVM, that's going to be, you know, orders of magnitude faster, or at least one order of magnitude faster uh, than than GCC. So for this reason, I think the, uh, the element compilation approach is, is the right way to go if you have a C++-based engine. We'll see examples of some Java-based database systems. They'll do this sort of the same thing. They'll emit Java uh, bytecode directly instead of you know, emitting Java code, then compiling that. OK? So where is this compilation cost coming from? So, you know, 37 milliseconds, it's not as bad as 400 milliseconds, but it's still a lot, right? My, again, my, my query, some queries can run in less than a millisecond, but it takes me 37 milliseconds to compile it, assuming I can't cache it ahead of time, then I'm not really getting any benefit. So what, 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 what's happening here? So the issue is going to be that compilation time is going to depend on the query size. So this means the number of joins we have, the number of predicates that we have, the number of aggregates, Right, just sort of how complex the query is, the more things we're trying to do, then the compilation time is going to go up. And now it's sort of this trade-off between like, well, if my query is going to run for 30 seconds, who cares if it took maybe an extra second to compile? Because I'm still going to get a big win uh, in terms of performance numbers that we saw over, over Oracle. But for other queries that are really fast, maybe the, the amount of data they, they may need to process, you can rip through very quickly because it's a column store you know, the compilation time could start eat, 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 eat into the execution time. So for all to be applications, this won't be an issue. And I'm going to take a guess why. Why would we care less for OLTP? Less joins. It says less joins. Uh, yes, that's, that's one of it. Yes, yes. Um, the execution of every single query is like relatively like, easy. Well, you were saying the same thing. So he's saying, the, execute, the complexity of the query is, is relatively easy compared to OLAP. It means they have less joins, right? So yeah, so the, the, the OLTP query is going to be way, way less complex. You're not going to do a 100 table join. It's going to be like, you know, look up Andy's record from, from the index and go get, you know, some, some basic information. And maybe do a join with a foreign key table. There's another reason as well. Caching, exactly. In OLTP applications, we're going to execute the same queries over and over again. Like I load the web page on Amazon. They do a query lookup in the index to get my record. He goes visits Amazon. It's the same query, just a different key. So you can cache that either as a prepared statement or like you know pre-compiled code, and we just invoke that over and over again, right? For OLAP, this 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 is going to be an issue. But where that trade-off is, when you know is you know having to decide, 
oh, this is good enough to compile versus just interpreting, that's hard to figure out, right? Because at the compiler level, when we're generating, we're doing cogen, we have a rough idea of how much data we're going to access, but those estimations can always be very wrong. Yes? And generally, OLAP queries are not like getting over in one, two seconds, right? They take sorry, get over in what, sorry? In one, two seconds. They take a lot of time, right? Like one, two minutes. So you were if it's in memory, if it's in memory, then it's, it can be really fast, right? We can run, like, so th I think I think this is like scale factor one. So this is like doing, um, you know, this is reading one gigabyte data in 35 milliseconds. Okay, so so multiply it by you know whatever terabyte is, 1024. So For in memory, this is an issue. For disk-based system, the disk is always going to crush you, so it matters less. Which is part of the reason why Oracle probably has never done this, at least for for the the, the traditional disk-based system. Correct. Yes. In memory, the the compilation time or the you know the, all the function lookups can be a bottleneck. This graph now, with that, is wrong, right? like, that Oracle is so high. I would say also too, like so, Postgres is, is a disk-based system. We'll see this in, in a second. They do compilation too as well. Uh, now, as, as of like 2018, um, but again, they have this little uh, parameter you can set to make decisions about should I actually compile or not based on what the execution cost of the query is actually going to be. So let me actually give it, I'm going to talk about what Hyper does. Um, the motivation for what Hyper is going to do here was they were trying to, just like us, they were trying to support the Postgres wire protocol and Postgres catalog. And so there's this com very uh, commonly used tool called PG Admin, which is like a PHP interface to uh, configure your Postgres installation. So the way all these, like, uh, these, these you know, visual database tools work is that when you turn them on, they connect to the database, it immediately run a, query, a bunch of queries against the catalog to figure out what tables do I have, what columns do I have, what indexes do I have, so they can expose that to the DBA to manage the database. So when you turn the, when you would, in, in Hyper's case, when you would turn PG Admin on and point it at Hyper, it would be this long pause at the very beginning, right? We're talking like maybe 10 seconds, because the PG Admin would fire off all these queries that then had to run through the LVM compiler just to figure out what tables you would have. Whereas like, if you run with regular Postgres, it doesn't do any of that compilation, so when you turn on PG Admin, it would be much more quick, you know, it would, it would boot up more quickly. So to solve that, so yeah, I would say else too. So those queries aren't that complex, but there was just a lot of them, and the compilation cost was, was eating, eating all your time. So this is a paper that came out in 2018 from the Hyper guys. It won best paper in ICD. I think this is actually a, uh, this is actually a really good idea. Uh, we tried doing this in Peloton, uh, but when we killed off Peloton, we didn't. We do something differently now. We we do something slightly different than what they're doing. But the idea here is 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 is, is a really good one. So what they're going to do is when a query shows up, they're still going to generate the IR uh, just as, as you normally would. But then rather than for firing off the LLVM compiler, waiting for that to finish and then start executing the query, they're going to have a IR interpreter. Think of this as like a VM that can then interpret that IR and start executing it. So they have, they, you, the, the German guy, Thomas, wrote it apparently in two weeks. You basically take the, 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 the byte codes that LVM spits out and it's IR, and you just implement a virtual machine to execute it. So now it's going to make all the same function calls to the rest of the system, make all the same, uh, invoke all the same operands and predicates as you normally would in the compiled engine, but it's running at, at, as, an interpreted, as an interpreter. So it's not like you have to build two separate engines completely. You just have the interpreter execute the same instructions that the, the compiled version stuff will. So now the interpreter is running. Then in the background, you start compiling the query. And then when the compiled query is ready, you just slide it in, if the query is still running, to replace the, the interpreter execution. So again, they're using morsels. So, so what would happen is every single time a, a thread, a worker thread, would complete a morsel, it would check some flag and say, is my compiled version ready? If yes, then invoke that. If no, then I just keep running my, my, in the interpreter. So now for those queries that could take a long time to compile, but will execute very quickly, in those cases, the, you could finish them off just through the interpreter and not wait for the long compilation stuff to finish. So they're actually going to do uh, uh, have to see three stages of different, different types of compilation you can do based on what top, type of optimizations they're going to do. 
So again, the SQL query shows up, and so in their case, their optimizer maybe takes you know, uh, 0.2 milliseconds. Then they have this code gen engine, and that takes 0.7 milliseconds, right? because you're, you're traversing the, the tree, spitting out the IR. And then the first thing that'll do is they'll, they'll pass off the IR to the, this bytecode compiler or, or interpreter and execute that. And so in some cases, that could finish up in 0.4 milliseconds. Sorry, sorry, it's a compiler. So you're, you're taking the IR and converting it to a bytecode that they can then interpret. That takes 0.4 milliseconds. Then the uh, IR also goes to the LAM compiler, but they turn off all the, the, the optimization passes, like unrolling loops and peephole optimizations. All that's turned off. So that complete in 6 milliseconds. So now that's going to be a little bit faster than this one. So when this one finishes, then you can replace this with this. But then they're also going to then, if it runs even longer, then they'll run it through all the optimization passes that the LLM provides. Right now you're doing like dead code elimination, sub-expression elimination, the peephole stuff. That, and then they can then run it through the compiler and then this picks out the x86 code. So the idea is that I start interpreting right away on the bytecode. If it finishes before, uh, you know, right away, then I'm done. If this thing finishes before this execu execution finishes, then I just start executing this. But then I also fire off this, this, this pass, and then if this, is, if, this is done, if this is not done by the time I get this, then I replace it with that. So you're sort of staging how fast the, the, the execution engine is going to get. Uh, and the idea is that rather than just waiting for this thing to finish, which again, in this particular example here, 25 milliseconds plus 70 milliseconds, rather than not executing any work during this time, I can at least get some work done. It's not going to be as, efi as efficient, but it, it, it's better than nothing. So they have uh, some, some numbers about TPCH for those three stages. Again, this is going to show you the relative difference in performance between the, uh, between the, the bytecode interpreter, the unoptimized LLVM, and the optimized LLVM. So again, you, you're getting an order of magnitude difference between the optimized compiled version and, and the interpreter. So that that's reason, you know, explains why you want to have both. The other benefit you do get, which they don't talk about so much in the paper, is that since, again, the, it's the same IR, the same sort of the, the, the bytecode is executing the same query that we're, we're execute here. If now there's a bug in how I generated that IR, rather than you know, looking at the compiled version of the query plan, which in this case here, you're not going to have debug symbols, you're not going to have a stack trace when you crash, it's, you're just going to land in an assembly. You can at least step through the interpreter with this and figure out why your query is, is breaking. Right? Yes? But, but with this, you can only figure out errors before this, after the bytecode to LLVM thing, if something wrong is happening, that you can't Yeah, so the statement is, uh, if there's a, back here, if there's a bug in this, com combining the IR into the bytecode, or bug in the interpreter itself, then yes, you, like, you have to figure out what's going on here. But the idea would be that the... Even there, like, below these two things, like, LLVM stuff also, like, from IR to the code, as the machine code. That's LLVM. Okay. So like, yes, the compiler could be wrong. The, okay, not the there's, a, well, there's a hierarchy of like what could be wrong, right? It's always like, like the first thing to blame is your code. Then the next thing to blame is maybe uh, yeah. the library you're using. Then maybe you next blame the, the compiler. And then maybe the very unlikely you blame the hardware. So the high probability your code is wrong. Like, this thing is not going to be wrong. So but the, the point I'm trying to make is, like, we don't have to write this. This is not going to be that difficult to write, and it's not something that has to be modified all the time as we expand new functionality, right? If we design a system such that it's, it's sort of general enough, you know, every time we, we add a new SQL function, it's not like we need to modify this. So only a, you know, a small number of smart people. Think about this. There's a small number of smart people that can write a database system. There's an even smaller number of smart, smart people that can write this piece. Right? And so we pay that person a lot of money to get this right and assume it's, it's right going forward. OK? All right, uh, we have 15 minutes. I want to rip through very quickly a bunch of different real-world implementations of this. So as I said, at the very beginning, I said, oh, Haiku uh, was the first, first example in the modern era. And the reason I, I use that exact phrasing is because IBM did this, as, as, as many things in databases, they did this in the 1970s, but then they abandoned it. But now, pretty much every, a lot of the systems today are, are using this approach. So IBM had a primitive form of CoGen and query compilation back in the 1970s for system R. 
remember, the System R project was they took Ted Cott's paper, handed it off to researchers at, at San Jose, got them in a room with a bunch of people with brand new PhDs and said, hey, build a database system, build a relational database system. Everyone carved, you know, every person with a PhD carved off one piece of it. One guy did storage, one guy invented SQL, another, another woman did query optimization, and then somebody did this code generation thing. Right? And then what would happen is they would take a SQL statement and they would have it spit out assembly that would then, again, just like in Haiku or the IR for LLVM, be exactly the, the baked in execution uh, plan for, for that query. And they would, they would have a bunch of templates and sort of splice things together. So it turned out, though, that this was a huge pain to ask to maintain the engineer because back in the day, in the 1970s, IBM had all these different mainframes that had all these different ISAs and instruction sets that they had to support. So in order to get System R to work on you know, you know, 360 or some, some other system, you had to make sure you ported all this assembly stuff, which was error prone. So when they went and, and started building DB2, some pieces of System R made it into whatever the version of DB2 they built first, uh, like the SQL stuff, but all this code generation st they stuff abandoned. The other big issue too was any time that the other parts of the system changed, like the layout of, 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 of pages for, on, for tuples or the indexes, you had to go change all of this assembly code, which was a huge you know, nightmare, because every time there was a change, you, know, you had to change this part and test it. So there's this great... Uh, there's a retrospective that came out in 1981 that talks about the history of System R, but then the, the main developers that worked at IBM at the time, they did like a, a panel or a bunch of interviews in the late or early 1990s that talked about you know, what it was like building a database system in the 1970s where no, nobody knew how to build a database system. And one of the things when you read those interviews, they talk about how this thing was a huge nightmare and that when they built DB2, they, they got rid of it, right? So Oracle, uh, for... They're high-end things like the Fracture Mirror in memory column store, and then for like Exadata, they, they do something similar. Uh, but like if you just download regular Oracle, uh, the disk-based version, it doesn't do any compilation for, for queries. They might do predicates, but again, that, that might only be for the, the, for the high-end versions of it. The one thing they do compile, though, is store procedures. So they're going to take your PL SQL store procedures, and convert them into pro C or pro star C, which is their specialized dialect of C, and then they'll compile that into native and C and C++ code. Um, and the, the, the reason why they're gonna do this is because this is gonna have a bunch of security checks to make sure that your store procedure is not doing something weird with, with the address space. So they don't, they don't have to run this in a sandbox, they can run this directly inside the database system, system process. The one thing that Oracle can do that nobody else can do that's super insane is like actually put the database operations directly on hardware. Now FPGAs are, are a thing that you can do and people have done this from database systems, uh, but those are, again, those are still slightly more general purpose. This is like they're actually manufacturing the CPU and they'll put specialized instructions for the Oracle database on the CPU. They bought Sun, I don't know, 15 years ago. Sun was making the Spark chips, so for some of the newer versions of Spark chips had like support for Oracle's compression algorithm or Oracle's bitmap stuff directly on, on hardware. So that avoids, you know, that, that blows out anything you can do with code gen because instead of, you know, compiling code that does the, uh, what your database wants to do, you just invoke the operations on the hardware itself. It doesn't get any faster than that. Um, I don't think they do this anymore because I don't think they make Sparks anymore. But this is maybe like four or five years ago they were touting this, that you could buy an Oracle uh, rack machine from them that had Sun, Sun's hardware, and they can make your Oracle database go faster. We'll talk about FPGAs at, at the end of the semester. For Hackathon, we've already talked about, they could compile both store procedures and SQL. Um, what was kind of cool is that they would have, um, they would pre-compile a bunch of these operators that allow you to have non-Hackathon qu uh, queries touch Hackathon data. I can run those efficiently. And the way they would do this is they would generate C code from the syntax tree of the query plan Compile that using, uh, you know, the, the, whatever, the, the, the Microsoft compiler, generate a DLL, then link that in at runtime, the same way that the Haiku actually did this. Um, and to make sure that anybody was doing something funky, they would have a bunch of extra checks to make sure that you, you, know, you didn't have a weird predicate that tried to do like a buffer overflow to take control of the system. Now, Actium Vector is what he was asking about before. So they're not really doing code gen. They're pre-compiling these primitives, and this is why I use the term. And think of a primitive as 
some low level operation you'd want to do on a piece of data repeatedly. But it's going to all going to be written for a uh, specific type. So I'll have a primitive to do a comparison between two numbers, or, and one will be for 32-bit, 64-bit, 16-bit, floats, right? I'll pre-compile all these primitives. Then now, at runtime, what my query plan is basically doing is it's stitching together all these pre-compiled primitives as if it was a bunch of C++ code that was, that was generated on the fly. And now I'm just making calls into these functions that are pre-compiled, and that's going to be almost as fast, or in some cases, faster. So looking at one example here, right? So here's L, a primitive to do it, uh, take, a, uh, take a pointer to a, a bunch of n32 uh, values inside of a column, take the value I want to compare against, and then I just do, do a less than. And if it matches, then I produce my output buffer. And here's the same function, but now I'm comparing uh, a double. So my input column is, is a 32-bit is a integer, but my comparison value is a double. So I just, you know, I just add that piece in there. And the compiler would generate the right uh, casting code for me, right? So we'll see this next class. We'll talk a little bit about the next class and also after spring break. But you would think, all right, well, isn't this going to be slow now if I'm invoking this function for every single tuple? Well, that's why they're passing in a, a, a pointer to a column. It's sort of in the name of vector-wise. Right? They're passing in a vector of tuples that this can then be vectorized by the compiler using SIMD instructions. So now I'm not doing a comparison between a single scalar and another scalar. I'm taking a batch of, of values, invoking a single instruction to execute that uh, more efficiently. Right? So again, we'll, we'll see this. Uh, we'll see how to do vectorization ne next class. But this, this is this is one of the reasons why, although Vectorwise is not a full cogen engine, you can still match the performance of a of a, of a cogen engine because you get this benefit here. Whereas Hyper can't do vectorized execution; it's only tuple at a time. All right. So now there's a bunch of database systems that are based on the JVM that run on the JVM. So Spark in 2015 announced they have this new tungsten execution engine. Spark's written entirely in Scala. So inside their source code, they have a way to take the predicates of a, of a, inside of your query, because Spark supports SQL. And then they'll convert that directly into Scala ASTs, which then can be generated into bytecode. And they can invoke that and execute that natively inside of the, the engine while it's running. So Spark is doing this for, for Scala. Again, it's, it's just running the JVM. There's a bunch of other JVM databases that are more or less all doing the same thing. Neo4j, Splice Machine, Presto, and Derby. Splice Machine uses Derby, so these, these two are kind of the same. Uh, I was looking at the Neo4j source code last night. It's not very good because there's no documentation. Um, but from what I can tell, it looks like that you can actually generate the, um, you generate the bytecode for your query and they, they can also then reverse it and put it back into Java source code. So if you want to again, now run it through a debugger and figure out you know, why your query isn't actually working, uh, they can actually support that. I don't know whether these other guys can do the same thing. Right? The other thing to think about, too, about using the JVM, because it's doing just-in-time compilation, I can emit the bytecode. Uh, I don't have to run any compiler passes on, on it right away. Then the, uh, the hotspot VM will recognize if, if I'm executing this, this, this bytecode over and over again in my for loop as I'm accessing every single tuple, it'll then do the compiler compilation stuff for me. So I don't need to do that multiple stages that we did with the LLVM. The JVM takes care of this for me, which I think is kind of cool. All right, so MemSQL is an interesting one because they have two versions of their engine. So as I said before, the MemSQL, one of MemSQL's co-founder was at, was at Microsoft when they were building Hackathon saw the early talks from, you know, internally from, at Microsoft, although he wasn't working on Hackathon, saw the talk from the researchers talked talk about how they were new code gen uh, for Hackathon using C. So when he went off and built MemSQL, he did more or less the same thing, which is the same thing as Haiku. So they would have code that would generate this, the, the C uh, source code for a query plan, then fork exec GCC, link in that shared object, and then run that query. And as I said, in the early versions of, of MemSQL, when you look at their blog articles, they would show examples where like the first time you run a query would be one second, because that's all the compilation overhead, but then the second times would be much faster. And the way they were able to make it go faster is through caching by taking any query that showed up, extracting out the constants, and then recognizing if the query, same query shows up again, just with different input parameters, I can reuse my cache share, uh, shared object. So my query shows up, select star from A, where A, A ID equals one, two, three. I recognize I have one, two, three here, rip that out to be a parameter, 
compile that, cache it, and then now if another query shows up with AID equals 456, I could recognize that I could reuse the same query plan and run that, and don't pay that compilation overhead. Now, we asked them, and they told us that the only thing they were doing here was just string matching. So if my predicate was like, where AID equals one and NBID equals two, I cached that one, but now if I show up with reverse of like BID equals one and AID equals two, then they couldn't reuse that. Even though semantically it's the same query, the, the string won't match, right? So then what happened was, uh, and actually the, the, the MemSQL guy, Nikita, told me that like, had in the early days of, of, of MemSQL, had they had to do it all over again, they would have not added this compilation stuff at the beginning because it was a huge pain for them to maintain. I think they were going through a lot of the same pains that the, the IBM guys were, were having. Yes? This compilation uh, is just a one-time uh, thing for a query, right? So how much of the overhead does it cost and how much can we prevent it from caching? Uh, so you said, so you, so your statement is, this compilation is expensive, but like, how much is it? How much is the overhead of the compilation versus the, the execution time of the query, and how much can we actually cache things? I mean, as you as you showed, it was thirty six milliseconds. Yes. It, right. So, like, but if a query runs for one millisecond, like, if, if you ran the interpreter and it took ten milliseconds, but my compile version runs for one millisecond, but it takes me twenty milliseconds to compile it, then I'm better off just running the interpreter. MemSQL, to avoid engineering overhead, you don't want to have to build two separate engines, right? So they would compile every query. So to avoid, and, and they were sort of focusing on all that things. So you could hope that most of the queries show up with the same pattern. You can reuse the, the cache plan over and over again. The question is, though, how much benefit it provides? Well, it depends on what the query is actually going to do. If I'm going to read one tuple, then, uh, then caching could help a lot because the query is going to be so short anyway. If I'm reading you know, a petabyte of data, caching is probably not going to make a difference. Who cares? Right? For in-memory, you know, most people don't have databases running in one petabyte of memory, because that would be super expensive. So most in-memory databases we're looking at are you know, tens of hundreds of gigabytes. I think MemSQL said they had somebody that was like 14 terabytes or something like that. Still a lot, but like, most queries aren't going to have to rip through everything. So. As I said, if they, the MemSQL guy told me they had to do so over again, they would not start it with, with the compilation stuff. But then they got a bunch of money, uh, which always makes things easier. And they hired the guy from, uh, from Facebook that built the hip hop VM for Facebook. So Facebook famously runs on PHP. PHP is an interpreted language, language and the, the default, at least, at least when I did PHP development back in the day, like the default PHP interpreter is, is super slow. So Facebook, uh, in order to get better scalability, they built their own VM that can compile PHP. So MemSQL hired the guy that invented or that worked on that hip hop VM and led that project to go rewrite the, the execution engine uh, to be entirely based on LLVM. So now they're going to do uh, what, what is, in my opinion, the right way to do a LLVM based query execution engine. And this is basically what we're doing now in our own system. So what they're going to do is they're going to take the physical query plan the optimizer spits out, and then they're going to first convert it into a, an imperative plan. That, that is written in a high-level domain-specific language, or DSL, that they call MPL, the MemSQL programming language. It basically looks like C++, and we'll, we'll see our example in a second. Then you take that DSL, and now you compile it into a bunch of opcodes. And then now you can have these opcodes be in, either interpreted or compiled. Now, in MemSQL's case, I think they always went straight and did compilation. But you could still have an interpreter the way that the Hyper guys did for, for their IR, right? And now the benefit you get from this is, from a database engineer, the actual people actually building the system, it's way easier for hire new people to work on this part and not worry about this part down here. Because I'm going I'm to assume that my really expensive, really smart people wrote this part correctly, and the everyone else, you know, I, I can I can can work on this part here. So you guys will, will be the same thing for your project three. If you end up working on the execution engine, most of you, if you want to add new features like new string functions and new SQL functions or date functions. You don't have to touch this part here. You just need to modify this part up here. Right? All right. Uh, Postgres added support for the LLVM compilation in 2018. First came out in version 11, but it uh, was turned off by default. And then now version 12, I think as of last year, uh, it's turned on by default. So every query, again, they have an internal cost model to decide whether I should do compilation or not. And they're going to do uh, compilation for predicates and tuple deserialization. 
and basically get removed, reduce the number of get next calls you have to have in, in the iterator model. So they're gonna to try to inline everything as much as possible, right? And the way they did it is super interesting is that they took all the backend Postgres code, like the actual, the server itself, that they have written in C, and they could then convert that same source code into LVM C++, uh, and then through that, they can then remove these iterator calls. So you sort of take the function to take, you know, add two numbers together, and they can pre-compile that in LVM C++ code. So now, as I do CoGen for queries, I invoke that C++ code and not the regular Postgres C code, right? Uh, I, we're, we're over time. I, I could give a demo, but we'll skip it. We'll do it at the end if we have more time. Uh, Cloud and Pal is another one that's using LLVM. So they only do predicates, uh, just like in Postgres, but they also do it for record parsing, which is interesting. So Impala doesn't have their own uh, like proprietary storage format. Like Postgres, MySQL, there's always proprietary you know, row, row, column layout of data. You know, they run on Parquet, they run on Avro, they run on all the Hadoop or, or cloud-based uh, file formats. So what they're gonna do is, in order, in order to parse these, these records more, uh, more quickly, they're gonna pre-compile a bunch of these uh, parsers ahead of time, or if my query shows up and I'm, I'm operating on some CSV file, since so I know what the schema is, I can then pre-compile the CSV parser, so I don't have to have this interpreter to look at like you know fine columns or commas and things like that. All right, I'm going to skip VTSDB. I want to quickly talk about ours. So, the first version of Peloton, we did what El Hyper did. We would have our C++ code spit out IR directly. Uh, we weren't doing full pipelining; they were doing. We actually can do. Uh, we actually introduced these these pipeline breakers at different parts of the query plan because now we can pass around vectors or tuple to get the benefits we have in vector wise. This will make more sense next class. Um, and we use software prefetching to hide this. So just to show some numbers, this, num this is what uh, my PhD student Prashant ran. So this is like the interpretive version of Peloton versus like the compiled version with and without this uh, uh, relaxed operator fusion technique. And so this is not a good uh, example of what the benefit you can get from compilation. Like this is like if you're retarded versus not retarded. Like the gray bar here of Peloton, that was a, it was a bad engine, right? It wasn't good at all. And so I don't want to get you the idea that you're, you're going to get 100x benefit or performance improvement through compilation. It's usually like from anywhere from 2 to, to 25x, right? But this is showing you here that, again, we can go from, this is like 88 eight seconds to 800 milliseconds, right? That, that's a pretty significant drop by doing compilation here, right? But we abandoned this because it was, it was a huge pain because now you need to be an expert in LLVM IR in order to debug anything or make any changes to the execution engine. Because when a query crashed, you land an assembly and don't have a stack trace. And only like two or three students could actually work on it. Now our new system, which is currently unnamed, but we have a name, we haven't announced it, is we do what MemSQL does, where we take the query plan, convert it into a high level DSL that's specific to our database system. It basically looks like C. Um, then we compile th that DSL into opcodes, and then we can interpret that opcodes while the compilation occurs in the background. <coughs> so it looks like this. My query plan shows up, I can then convert this into some, some dialect, which again looks like C, like this is doing a scan on foo, and then has this predicate on column A, column B. Well, inside of my, my, my DSL, I'm doing that operation directly. But now I'm not gonna convert this into opcodes. The exact details doesn't, don't matter, but like this is actually human readable, right? Like we have things like table vectors to iterate over tuples and get next and, and have function calls to, to, to get integers and things like that. So now I can then take this opcode start interpreting it immediately, and start, which means I can start executing without having to run the compiler. Then in the background, I run my LLM optimized compiler, I generate C++, I generate my shared object, I can then link that in and, and fire it off, all right? Again, that was a bit rushed. Uh, I can show a demo of this next class. All right, so uh, the main takeaways from this is that query compilation is super important. Any, every modern data system is gonna wanna do this. The problem is gonna be, it's gonna be not easy to implement. You need to know something about compilers and, and low-level systems. The MemSeq approach, as of 2016, is the way to go. Um, and every system now is, is, is exploring this. All right, so next class, we will discuss vectorization. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about Project 3 topics. Okay? Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the O.E. Because I'm O.G. Ice Cube down with the S.T.I. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40. My buzz on, cause I needed just a little more kick. Hook like a fish after just one sip. Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off. Eight ball just dropped up. Cause ain't I 
has happened off. 